All right, guys, if you clicked on this video, I'm sure you saw just how long it actually was. Now, that's because I couldn't trim it down any shorter. There's so much good information in this episode that I wanted you guys to have all of that available. Now, if you do want to skip forward to certain sections, I have included those chapters down below. And in the future, I am going to be releasing a Cliff Notes version of this episode, really condensed down to just the basics. But I'm telling you right now that if you watch that short video and you want to ask a question, I can almost guarantee you that that question is going to be answered in this episode, the long episode. So do me a favor, watch this entire video, click the like button if you feel like you're getting some great value out of it. Hope you guys enjoy. So this is how this test is going to work. We're going to need a baseline here. So this engine is a 2005 Hemi Magnum RT with 126,000 miles on it. We're gonna go ahead and fire this engine up cold right now. The ambient temperature outside is 49 degrees. We're going to fire this thing up cold and we're going to use the scan tool here, which I just have set directly on our oil pressure sensor. We're going to read the oil PSI both at idle and at 3,500 RPM. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the engine up to full operating temperature and take those readings again at idle and at 3,500 RPM. Then we're going to swap in the Melling high volume oil pump and I'll show you that whole process and take the readings again with those same parameters. Finally, we're going to switch to the Hellcat oil pump and do the same thing. And like I said, you're gonna get those results, positive or negative. Let's fire this thing up cold and see what we got. Quite high, we're initially reading 58 PSI here. That's actually pretty surprising, 58 PSI. I wasn't expecting that while it's cold. Let's see what we get at 3,500 RPM. <laughs> 75 PSI cold. That's actually really good. Now, of course, this does make a difference because it is only 49 degrees outside. That's definitely pretty cool, but 56 PSI idle is definitely better than I was expecting. Let's go ahead and bring this thing up to full operating temperature, see just how far that drops down. In this case, I'm kind of expecting to see a number around 35 PSI, but I wouldn't be too surprised if it drops below that even. So this worked out even better than I could have imagined. Now that the engine is all the way up to operating temperature, I have a reading here on engine temperature. It's reading at 208 degrees, which is your standard thermostat on one of these Hemi engines, 208 degrees. And the oil pressure reading is actually dipping down now into the 23 PSI range. Now, it's 49 degrees outside. You can imagine that if it was 80 or 90 degrees or even hotter, you'd be dipping down into the teens here. That is what we're trying to correct is this oil PSI idle. That's a number that I'm just not that comfortable with and that's the reason why I think this upgrade really matters. Okay, we've got our reading here idle. Let's go ahead and run this thing up to 3500 RPM and see what our pressure reading is right there. All right, so we're reading 60 PSI of oil pressure when we read this thing up. That is totally fine. So you know that this is not a mechanical issue with the pump itself. It's delivering exactly what it's capable of delivering. If you replace this oil pump with a brand new one, you might see a very marginal difference in it, but honestly, you're not going to see a significant enough change, especially at these idle readings. Look, we're down to 22 PSI even, now that's 212 degrees. So it's really come down to a number that I'm just not comfortable with. Well, I don't think I could have asked for anything more from our first test. That perfectly illustrated what the issue is in these engines. Once they get up to that operating temperature, that oil really thins out, makes it really hard to maintain that operating pressure. Now, the first thing that we're going to do here, we have our baseline. We're gonna go ahead and tear this thing down and put the Melling high volume oil pump in there. Now, to those of you who have pre-2009 Hemi engines, this is absolutely the pump that I would recommend because it has that higher volume capability and there's no modifications that you have to do. It's a direct bolt ton fit. Just like for the people who have a 2009 and later Hemi, the Hellcat oil pump is a direct fit on those engines. The Melling high volume pump is a direct fit on these engines. Now, I am still going to be testing the Hellcat pump on this engine, but I will have to do some modifications to make that work. But I did still want to get that data to you guys. Now, way back in September, when I very first came up with the idea for installing the Hellcat oil pump on the Hemi engine, I made a video about it and some commenters were upset that I did not properly explain the relationship between pressure and flow. And to be honest, that's a pretty accurate criticism. I should have explained that better. And in fact, I wanna do that now. I wanna provide kind of a demonstration for you guys to explain the concept of what it is that we're actually trying to accomplish here. 
Now, I also had some commenters on that video who were saying, well, if you're concerned about your oil pressure at idle, why don't you just upgrade to say 1030, 1040 oil, or maybe just pour a quart of Marvel Mystery Oil in there, and you'll solve that low oil pressure idle situation. Now, hopefully with this demonstration, I'll show you guys why that's not going to accomplish the goal that we're after. Okay, for our demonstration, we have this jug of 520 oil here. That's one of the most commonly used viscosities in a Hemi engine. Obviously, the newer ones are a 040, but 520 is what you're gonna see quite a bit of. Now, on the other side, we have some 80, 90 weight gear oil. Now, obviously, this is not something you would use in your engine, but I wanted to exaggerate it to really clearly show you guys in this demonstration exactly what I'm talking about. Now, to make something clear real quick, your oil pump does not provide pressure. It provides flow. What provides pressure is the restriction inherent in your engine oiling system. So with this 520 oil, I should be able to squeeze this jug here and pretend it's the oil pump and actually force this oil up through your oiling system and down into our container here. Now, it should take a moderate amount of pressure to accomplish that. Let's give her a try. All right, actually, I'll use two hands here but fairly, whoa, <laughs> I was waiting for that. Okay, with relatively moderate pressure, I should be able to squeeze this 520 oil, let it come up through the hose here, through your oiling system, and down into our container. Now we're gonna switch over to the 8090 weight. Let's see how much effort it takes to actually push this fluid through. All right, able to get it up there, but let me put some more force into it. Coming down the hose. And there we go, into the container. All right, let's let off there. So what exactly did we learn from this demonstration? I mean, I'm pretty sure all of you already knew that 90 weight oil is much thicker than 520 weight oil. Well, as you can see, because of the restriction of the hose itself, it made it much more difficult to push that thicker fluid through and therefore required a lot more pressure. So let's say that somebody decides to upgrade to a 1030 or 1040 oil. You haven't changed anything about the oiling capabilities of that pump. It still provides X amount of oil for every single revolution. You've just added a thicker fluid to it, which in turn translates to more resistance, which is reflected by having more pressure. So it looks like you're doing something because that pressure number goes up, but in fact, you haven't changed anything about the oiling capabilities of the engine. And in fact, an argument could be made that you've actually made things a little bit worse. So let's translate that to the Hellcat oil pump. Now the reason why this works is because we are actually pushing a higher volume of oil through the oiling system per every single revolution of that pump. And that in turn is what causes that higher pressure number. It's more just a byproduct than anything else. What we're after is that additional oil that is going to those vital engine components. Now, another point I'd like to clarify, a lot of people are concerned. They're saying, hey, if I've got 70, 80, 90, 100 PSI of oil pressure, won't I start blowing out seals left and right with this thing? And I honestly was a little bit confused by that statement to start with until I realized something that a lot of people maybe don't understand that your pressurized oiling system only takes place within very certain passageways within your engine. Any sort of gaskets or seals, like say a front crank seal, a rear main seal, valve cover gaskets, those are not exposed to high pressure oiling systems. They're only exposed to your crankcase pressure, which is very, very mild indeed. So unless you have a crankcase ventilation system issue, you don't have to worry about blowing out any seals. Okay, I hope that more clearly explains the concept of why we're doing what we're doing. Let's get back into it. Is anyone else thinking about the irony of the fact that I literally just put this engine in this car and now I'm gonna start taking it apart again? Just me? All right. All right, first things first, we're gonna get the simple things out of the way. Let's go ahead and get this air box out of here. We're going to take the intake manifold off and then we're gonna start taking some of the front accessories off. Now I do have some good news here that you can actually change out the oil pump with the engine still in the vehicle and it doesn't require massive disassembly in order to do so. It's actually a fairly straightforward process. Now you don't necessarily have to remove the intake manifold entirely. Generally I would because it makes it a little bit easier to get everything just out of the way so you have more room to work. In fact, I am going to remove it all the way. I was going to say that you can just leave it kind of out of the way and not have to undo the fuel line or anything like that, which makes a bit of a mess. But you know what? 
It's just not worth it to have it in here cluttering up our space. I like having the freedom to work, especially because where we're going to be working is fairly tight anyway. So I don't want to compound that by having this hanging around. So I'm taking the intake manifold out. That's immediately better. I'm very much happier with that having all this room open. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to remove the serpentine belt from here. Then I'm going to unbolt our power steering pump and just lay it out of the way. I'm also going to unbolt our tensioner assembly right here. And then I'm going to go ahead and drain the coolant as best as I possibly can. You're not going to get all of it, but if you can drain a lot of it, that would be really helpful to this point. Now, after we get that all out of the place, I think I'm going to try to get our fan assembly out of here. Now, the fan assembly is just held in by two 10 millimeter bolts, one on each side. You have your big fan connector here. Go ahead and disconnect that. And then the whole entire assembly should lift up and out of the way. Now, it is a very tight fit with the water pump right there, but it can be done. So it takes some finagling, a little bit of jiggling, but you'll see the whole process here in just a couple of minutes. All right, let's get this serpentine belt off of here. Now a good tip is to really pay attention or even draw a little diagram of the serpentine belt before you remove it from the vehicle. That way you know how it goes back on. Now in this day of the internet, it's easy enough to just look up a photo or a reference to figure out you know, how exactly that goes, but it's just one quick extra step to just draw a real quick diagram. Okay, it goes around this way, that way. That way you don't mix it up when you put it back on. Now the power steering pump here is held on with just three bolts, three 10 millimeter bolts, and then this whole thing will just lay back out of the way. You don't have to disconnect any of this stuff. You don't wanna to have to make a huge mess and have to end up adding fluid or bleeding the system when you're done. Just unbolt it, lay it out of the way. Okay, we've gotten a couple of these front accessories out of the way. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to get this fan assembly out of here right now. I don't know if I'll be able to with this upper radiator hose in place, but I'm gonna give it a shot real quick. If not, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and drain the coolant and then take the upper radiator hose off. And then I should be able to snake this fan assembly out of here. Again, it is a little bulky, a little bit awkward, but not too big of a deal. Now one tip I have for you for draining coolant is you wanna go ahead and pull the radiator cap off as well. That means there's no longer a vacuum on the system and it'll allow it to flow freely as best as possible down into your drain pan. Now, while that is draining, we're gonna move on to another area here and we're gonna actually go ahead and unbolt the AC compressor. Now, I mentioned this in some of the other videos I've done, but you do not have to discharge the AC system when you're doing this. All you have to do is unbolt the AC compressor from that front timing cover and the block and it will hang back out of the way. This is a really nice step because you don't actually have to discharge it. Now, the trucks are a little bit of a different story because they have their AC compressor mounted on top of the timing cover. You might be able to get away with just kind of pushing it back out of the way and that way you can pull the timing cover off. I'm not sure, I haven't tried it myself, but on the trucks, you might end up having to actually discharge the AC. All right, now we've got this upper radiator hose out of the way. We should be able to get this fan assembly out of here. Let's give it a try. Look at that, like a champ. One of the other accessories you're going to have to unbolt from the front timing cover before you remove it from the vehicle is the alternator assembly. Now this means that you should absolutely have your battery disconnected while you do this because obviously you do have that positive terminal on the back of the alternator and if your battery's plugged in with that disconnected and it touches anything, you're gonna have a spark show which could eventually be a fire show. You don't want that. So go ahead and disconnect your battery before you actually unbolt your alternator. Got it. Now it's time to take our lower radiator hose off from the timing cover. Now you don't need to remove this hose entirely. You just need to position it out of the way. There's enough room to get it out of there without that. We'll also need to remove this upper uh, heater line here, this cooler line. All you have to do is take off this 10 millimeter hose here and pull off the 10 millimeter that connects it to the head itself and the whole thing will slide up and out of the way. Sometimes it helps to take a small pry bar and just stick it in here, bloop, pop that guy up out of there. So now we come to the only part of this job that actually is a little bit tricky and requires a special tool. And I'm talking about a crankshaft damper pulley tool. Now, the thing about it is that the Chrysler pulleys 
Your standard three jaw pullers generally will not work on them. It is too tight of a fit between the different arms there to actually grab onto the little ledges that are necessary. So you have to have these special pullers. Now, there's a few different ones on the market. I'm not going to list them here because it depends. Uh, I really like the OTP tool ones. That one works really well for the Chrysler models. However, there's a lot of different Chrysler model pulleys. So you're gonna have to do a little bit of research on your own to figure out which pulley you have and which puller that you will actually need. So that is one special tool that is required to do this job. Like I said, your standard three jaw pullers won't get it done. Now this is especially tight in here. It is a very close fit to the radiator. However, we should not have any problem getting this thing pulled all the way off. Let's give it a try. Yes. Okay, that was a little bit of a battle to get that crank pulley off of there, but with the right tool, it really makes a difference. You can get that thing off of there. Now, the whole timing cover is ready to come off. I've mentioned this before. You do not actually have to remove the water pump from the timing cover to remove it. You only have to remove the long bolts that go all the way through into the block itself. Now, how do you know which ones are the long ones? Well, this very top one right here at the very center, that is going to be a long bolt, and then it is every other bolt after that that is a long bolt. Now that's regarding the water pump itself. Now there's a couple other bolts that hold the timing cover to it. And then also you have five 10 millimeter bolts that come from the bottom up through the oil pan into the timing cover. So make sure you get all of those bolts as well. If you think you have all the bolts out and you're prying on it and it won't come off, stop. There's a bolt that you're missing somewhere. Look again, try to find the bolt that you're missing. So with that being said, let's get into it. Let's get these bolts out of here. Let's get this timing cover off and expose that oil pump. Now the Hemi engine is very much like a lot of modern engines in that the timing cover is modular. This means that while the block remains identical, they can bolt various different timing covers to it for different applications, whether it be cars, trucks, things like that. With that being said, I can't give you a lot of specifics about which exact bolts we're taking out because they are slightly different for the different models that are out there. Now, the one thing I will encourage you to do is to pay a lot of attention to the bolts that you're taking out and the lengths of them, because there are different lengths. In this case, particularly, we have two really long ones. We have, looks like eight of the medium sized ones and we have one short one. So you really wanna pay attention to where that short one came out of. Now it will become apparent when you put it back on that the short one won't fit any other place than that one spot. But regardless, it's always better to do your homework beforehand while you're taking the bolts out. Maybe just draw out a little diagram on a piece of paper and say, okay, this bolt came out here, this bolt came out of here. That way you know for sure when you put it back together again, it just makes things so much easier. All right, so this timing cover is ready to come off. We have our five bolts out that came from the oil pan. We've got all the bolts out from the face. Now, I did not actually pull this timing cover last time when I was doing the refresh on the engine, so it will be a little bit stuck to the block. So you can use a pry bar. However, it shouldn't take a whole lot of effort to go ahead and pop it loose. <laughs> you can use the cylinder head as a bit of a pry point. There we go. Making a mess, as expected. There it is, timing cover is off. Okay, before we go any further here, you'll see that I put the crankshaft damper bolt back in place. The reason for that is because we're gonna spin the engine over and put the engine at top dead center. Now there's a reason for that. We're not pulling the camshaft or anything like that. However, when you're trying to remove the oil pump, it is far easier on the 09 and up models to remove the timing chain tensioner from the vehicle. That gives you enough room to actually rotate the oil pump enough to get to your oil pump pickup bolt. Now, when you do that, the chain is going to have slack in it and it could potentially come off of the bottom gear on the crankshaft. So we wanna set our timing first before we do that. That way, just in case the chain comes off, we know for a fact that our crankshaft is already in time. And then all we have to do is verify that our camshaft sprocket is in place. When we put that tensioner back on, we'll be in perfect shape. You won't have to worry about it. Now, a lot of times people will ask me, when you're putting this engine in the top dead center, how do you know whether it's on the compression stroke or on the exhaust stroke? And the reality is, it doesn't matter. The crankshaft itself doesn't care what stroke it's on. It just has to be at top dead center. So that's all we're concerned about is what the crank is doing because we can see the camshaft timing mark. So we can get that lined up no matter what, as easy as pie. All we're worried about is the crankshaft because the crankshaft timing gear and the mark that's on it 
it's pretty much impossible to see with the oil pump in place. So we want to make sure that that crank is timed before we take that oil pump off. So on the pre-VVT Hemi engines, the ones without the camshaft phaser here, there'll be a single dot on that cam sprocket. And that dot needs to go 12 o'clock here, dead center with the top of the engine. That's how you know that it's going to be in time. Now on the later models, the 09 and later that have VVT, there's going to be a vertical line embossed into the cam sprocket. And that needs to be set at 12 o'clock to let you know that you are in time. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the best way to actually remove the oil pump from the engine on a 2009 and later engine is to remove that timing chain tensioner. To do that, you have to actually push that tensioner back a little bit, and there's a little hole there that when the holes line up, you can stick an Allen wrench or something in there to pin that tensioner in place, and then just remove the two 10 millimeter bolts that hold that tensioner in place, pull it right on out of there. That will give you enough room to take the oil pump and once you take those four 13 millimeter bolts out of the front of it, you can twist it enough to get to that oil pump bolt on the bottom side, the oil pump pickup tube. Now on this engine, because it is pre-VVT, we have a little bit more room. So as soon as we take those four 13 millimeter bolts out, we should be able to pivot the oil pump quite a bit to get to that oil pump pickup tube. Now, if you have a Ram 1500 or a Durango or anything like that, that's not going to work for you. You will have to re actually remove your engine oil pan because your pickup tube bolts to there in more than one location. On these engines, it simply bolts with a one bolt to the oil pump itself. Therefore, once you get to that bolt and undo it, you can just let the pickup tube hang and set down in the pan itself. So we've got our four bolts out of the way. Now you can see that we can actually pivot the oil pump itself quite a bit. And we should have easy access to our pickup tube here. Now the pickup tube bolt is another 13 millimeter. Do your best not to drop it down to the oil pan because while you can fish it out with a magnet, it's a pain in the butt. Now that oil pump pickup will actually just lay down in the pan itself. You don't have to worry about that. It can just rest there until you go to hook up the new oil pump. All right, oil pump is out. All right, you guys, a lot of information in this video. Thank you very much for sticking with me. If you appreciate that information that I'm providing you and the effort I went through to get that for you, please do me a favor, go to our website, reignitedtx.com, go to our shop and see what kind of merch we have available. It's a major part of how I'm trying to support this channel right now. So if you can support me in that way, I'd really appreciate it. We just got our brand new merchandise drop available here. Everything is on the website that we do have. So we have our black sweatshirts here with the reignited logo. We have our flat brim hats with our reignited logo on there. They're flex fit style in the back. We have t-shirts available in a variety of different colors. They have the reignited logo on the front and they're empty on the back. Also, we do have different colors available. I think actually just the green here of the hoodie, which I really like the green. I think it's a nice option. So again, if you guys at least feel like you wanna do that, we also do have sticker packs available. If you feel like you wanna support me in that way, please click that link down below and check it out. And just a quick note, there's no third party company handling any of this. All of our merchandise is handled strictly by my wife and I. So every single penny that we make from this goes right back into the channel into producing better content for you guys. All right, that is it for me for right now. Let's get back to the video. So here we have our Melling high volume oil pump as compared to the stock pump. Now, if you watched my previous videos, you'll know that I actually took these pumps apart and measured the thickness of the rotor inside these pumps. And on these pre 2009 5.7s, the rotor thickness was 12 and a half millimeters. On the 2009 and later 5.7s, it's 14 millimeters. And on the Hellcat oil pumps, it's 16 millimeters. So you can see quite the progression of volume improvement there. Now this Melling high volume pump, the rotor thickness appears to be about 15 millimeters is what I measured. So not quite as big as the Hellcat pump, but a massive improvement over the stock pump with 12 and a half millimeters. So I really think we're gonna see the gains that we want there. Now, these milling pumps do come with a couple of different springs here, so you can change the overall relief pressure that it has. I'm not concerned about that because again, the overall upper end of the pressures was just fine, even with the stock pump, that's not really an issue. Now, they do also come with a oil pump pickup tube O-ring, which 100% you need to be replacing that each and every single time that you remove that pickup tube from the oil pump. So we're gonna slap this guy on, put this milling pump in there, and put everything back together again. One last point of note about the Melling pump here is that you'll notice that the casting is different on the Melling pump versus the stock pump. What that means is that they did not modify a stock pump for their purposes, rather this is their own casting entirely. 
First thing we're going to do is kind of just slip this into place here and try to get our pickup tube put back in. All right, so once you get it kind of on the snout here, it does take some wiggling and some finagling. You have to jiggle it a fair bit to get the splines to line up with the timing gear on the crank. Just keep working at it a little bit here, a little bit there. Don't get too frustrated with it. Can be a little bit finicky. There we go. All right. So what I need to do is I need to go ahead and tighten up the oil pickup tube all the way. We'll get that snugged up. And again, there is a torque spec on this, but you probably won't exactly be able to accomplish it because you're not gonna be able to get a socket on there. All you can get on there is just a wrench. So go ahead and just snug it up. Also note when putting this on that there is no gasket that goes behind the pump right here. It is a direct connection to the block itself. I admit it is tough to get a good camera angle of exactly what is happening here. I would love to just leave you on this angle here, but this is where I stand, so it's kind of hard to do that. So now that we have the new oil pump in place, basically it's just a matter of cleaning that gasket surface right there. Go ahead and clean that up as best you can. And then a matter of reassembly. Now the only thing of note here when you're putting the timing cover back on is that at these corners, Right down here where the block meets the oil pan, you wanna put a thin bead of silicone right there in that corner on each side to help seal it up just in case there's any issues when you put the timing cover back on. All right, we've got our new timing cover gasket in place. What a lovely shade of green. Let's reinstall the timing cover here. There are a couple of dowels that actually slip into place so you kind of know it's seated. Now, I do recommend that as you pull this thing in with your bolts here, go ahead and install all of the bolts first before you tighten any of them because potentially if you tighten one on the top edge or the bottom edge and then try to get to the others, there could be some binding involved there and they won't wanna go in smooth. So go ahead and hand tighten a few of these, just run them in a couple of threads so that you have all the bolts in place and then start tightening in the even pattern side to side to make sure it actually sucks on there perfectly smoothly. At that point, it's really just a matter of reassembly. We're gonna get this thing all the way back together again. A point of note is that you did just dump a bunch of coolant down into your oil, so you're going to need to do an oil change here as soon as you get this thing all back together again. Do not fire it up because there's a ton of coolant down in your oil pan right now. Like I say, it's truly amazing how much you can accomplish when you are not having to film absolutely everything. I would say that this took me about, let's say about 35 minutes to get everything completely back together again, ready to go. Now I've already filled and bled the cooling system. I do have to do an oil change tomorrow. We'll get some fresh oil in there and we'll see exactly what numbers this Melling high volume oil pump puts out. All right, so we got ourselves all charged up with some fresh oil. Now you will note that I put the exact same oil in here as I had in there during the first test, just some of this cheap Napa brand 520 semi-synthetic oil. So the test will be identical back to back. Now, because I do have a brand new oil pump in there, I don't exactly want to just fire this thing up completely dry. I'd like to give it a chance to actually prime itself first. So I'm going to once again, pull the fuel pump fuse in this vehicle and actually crank it over for at least a minute or so intermittent cycles so I'm not overheating the starter of course but crank it over for at least a minute to make sure I have good oil pressure now what I'm also going to do is because I have just done an actual service on this engine with pulling the timing cover off I'm going to fire the thing up get it fully to operating temperature and let it cool back off again before I actually look at the data I don't want to have the data skewed in any way so I want to make sure everything is as it should be just like it was for the previous test so like I said I'm gonna run the thing, bring it up to temp, but I'm not gonna look at any of the numbers. I'm gonna let it cool back down and then we will run our tests. Go ahead and cycle the key a couple of times, get that fuel pressure built up in the rail. Oh, there we go. Always a good sign when it fires like that. Don't see a bunch of leaks immediately, which is always important. All right, everything looks and sounds good. Let's go ahead and get this thing up to temperature. So we've ran this thing through a full heat cycle. I did not look at any of the numbers. I didn't want to know because I didn't want to cheat. Now it's cooled completely back down. The ambient temperature outside is 54 degrees. The engine coolant temp is reading at 46 degrees. Let's fire this thing up and see what our cold idle PSI pressure looks like. Yeah, that's some oil pressure. We are reading 85.2 PSI cold. <laughs> 85 PSI. Now let's go ahead and rev this thing up to 3,500 RPM and see what the number is.
Okay, as I suspected, this pump is regulated at 100 PSI. So right at 99 PSI, go ahead, it bleeds off that excess pressure. So sitting at 80, about 85 PSI right now, 100 when you rev the thing up. Let's go ahead and let this thing warm up to full operating temperature and we'll see just how far that number drops. Now we've got the engine up to temperature. We're at 208 degrees. The thermostat has fully opened. It's been circulating for a while. And our oil PSI numbers is sitting right at 37 PSI. Now again, this could potentially drop a little bit more based on ambient temperature and the heat in the engine itself once it gets up, you know, 220 degrees, something like that. But let's all be honest here, 37 PSI is a heck of a lot better than potentially 19 PSI like we were seeing before. So that's a massive result and exactly what I'm looking for. Now let's do our test at 3,500 RPM, again with the coolant temp at 210 degrees. Yeah, see it's reading all the way up at 85, 86 PSI. So again, you've got tons of oil pressure up high. Well, I think those Melling oil pump tests were exactly what we could have hoped for. Now we're going to do this whole entire process all over again, get that Hellcat pump installed in there and see what kind of differences there are. Now I do believe that the rotor thickness on that gear is just a little bit bigger than the Melling one. So we should see even a little bit higher numbers at idle here, but let's go ahead and just get stuck into it. I'll show you guys all the like little modifications I'm going to have to make to make the Hellcat pump work on one of these pre 09 engines. So we are working on how to adapt a Hellcat oil pump to a pre-2009 Hemi engine. Remember, if you have a 2009 or later, it is a direct fit bolt-on for you. Now on these pre-2009, it's gonna take a little bit more effort here. And what I've done is I went ahead and adopted the advice given by quite a few of the subscribers there that I just take another timing gear and go ahead and splice an extra end on there. Because if you watched a previous video, you'll know that the newer style oil pumps got pushed out about 17 millimeters from where they were before. So the stock timing gear does not actually, it will engage with the splines, but it's only about an eighth or three sixteenths of an inch. And I'm just not comfortable with that. I want it to be fully engaged there. So I need to have a longer timing gear. Now I went ahead and purchased a Hellcat timing gear because I was thinking, well, it has its own specific timing or it has its own specific part number. So maybe that means that it is a little bit longer than the standard one. It'll be a direct fit on this older style engine. Unfortunately, when I actually received the timing gear, it was literally identical to what came in a standard 5.7 liter. So there goes a hundred dollars of my money for absolutely no reason whatsoever. So I ended up chopping it all up and now we are adding an extension here to this timing gear for the pre-2009 Hemi engine. So basically, I'm just gonna weld this thing on. We've gotta make sure we get this thing fully squared up so the splines actually go in as like they're supposed to. So we'll get this thing squared up, weld it up, get it installed, and test out that Hellcat oil pump. Now I'm gonna try a technique here for lining these things up. You want this thing to be absolutely as concentric as possible. And you could eyeball it for sure, but I do want to try this out. I don't know if this is actually going to work or not. Basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these two pieces of angle iron here, wrap it around either side of it, and then run a hose clamp around the whole thing and then tighten that as best as possible. And hopefully that'll center it as completely as possible. And that way I can actually weld these corners here. I'm only going to weld it along where the splines are. It doesn't need to be welded all the way around. Again, this is just for testing purposes. I'm not really, thinking of using this thing long term. So we'll just weld it up here and hopefully this will work. We'll give it a try, I don't know. Okay, hopefully you can see here, we've got this thing kind of strapped up. Tried to line everything up on the interior side as well. So I actually think we look pretty darn good here. I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, let's go ahead and tack this thing up and see where we get to. Well, I have to say that I do not recommend this process that I've done here where I've welded this on because this timing gear actually has some oil impregnated in it. So as I was welding, that was spitting and popping and making a big old mess there. So I welded it with some stainless rod just to be safe and it'll hold up no problem at all, but this is not a good long-term solution for this
Well, I think the verdict is officially in here. If you have a pre-2009 Hemi engine, do not use the Hellcat oil pump on there. It is far too much of a pain to try to make it work. You can, I'm making it work, but I have to resort to sheer butchery to make it work. I took this old timing cover that I have and I went ahead and cut out all of the webbing here, took out all of the bracing that's cast into this just so I can make this thing fit beside behind this plate here. Now, we're going to do these tests, but this is not something I endorse long-term at all. I'm going to be taking this timing cover back off because this engine is coming back out to do something else with it. So this is just temporary in order to actually run these tests. All right, let's talk for a minute about what happened yesterday. As you can see, my entire workbench is a complete disaster. The benches behind me are a complete disaster. And that only happens when I personally am experiencing a complete disaster. And that's what yesterday was a complete and total failure. On these pre-2009 Hemis, there is a fair bit of modification that's necessary and that's what I was trying to achieve. However, in the process of doing so, I overlooked two very important things that ended up being major mistakes and completely nullified any progress I made. I'm gonna point those out to you right now and then we're gonna show you what I'm gonna to do to actually fix those problems and hopefully get that Hellcat pump on there today. So the two mistakes that I made were based on not understanding how exactly this system works here and how the components all go together. I was basically making assumptions, which is how you get yourself into trouble. Now, the first mistake that I made was with this lower timing gear. Now, on the nose of the timing gear, it is smooth. There is no splines. The splines only go out to a certain length, and then it's just a round portion on the end. Now, initially, my thought was that basically this was just a helper to help you guide the oil pump up onto this timing gear, but that was an incorrect assumption. In fact, when you actually install the oil pump on there, this circular portion on the end actually locates the snout of the pump and allows it to align correctly. Now the bolt holes themselves will do that when you mount up the pump, but there's some wiggle room in there and you want this thing to be perfectly aligned. This smooth portion of the timing gear actually allows for that to happen. So when I had made my custom sprocket, I had cut that snout portion off and therefore my pump was going to be misaligned from the very beginning. Now I would not even have known that had I not made the second mistake. Now the second and far more important mistake that I made was not understanding the relationship between the crankshaft damper and the lower timing gear. Now initially when I was thinking about the damper, I thought that you just, it's a press fit design, so I thought that it just runs onto the crankshaft snout itself until the face of the damper here is even with the end of the crankshaft and then tightens down from there. And that was completely incorrect. How this actually works is that the length of this crankshaft damper snout here actually sets the depth of the crankshaft pulley itself in relation to all the other accessory pulleys on the front of the engine. And what it does is that snout runs up into the face of this lower timing gear right here, which makes sense because it holds it in place. It keeps it from rattling around, anything like that. So you have to actually set that depth correctly. So now that I've got this new timing gear that I'm modifying to be longer to fit that new Hellcat pump, because again, it pushes it out 17 millimeters from the original location, that means in order to make the depth correct on my actual crankshaft pulley here, I have to actually cut a portion of this snout off to make it have the proper depth to it. So I did have to do a little bit of math there, very simple math, but I did have to do a little bit of math there. I think we're on the right track now. I'm pretty sure we're in the right direction. I think I've got the right solution this time around. We'll see, but the goal is let's get that Hellcat pump in there today. So this is what I should have done the first time is mocked it up completely on this spare engine here. There you can see just how much it's pushed out from its stock location. And then I've got my shortened snout on my crank pulley so that it exactly butts up against it. I do have the round portion on the front of the timing gear to center the pump on there. So I think we're in good shape. You can see how close it is to the front of the pan, but that part of it does actually clear because I had this installed yesterday. Well, it's been a little bit of a nightmare, but we do finally have all of our parts and pieces we need to actually swap that Hellcat pump onto the engine. Now, I'm sure a few of you guys are thinking, why in the world are you going through all of this effort to swap that on when the Melling high volume pump will basically accomplish the exact same thing? Well, the only answer to that is because I promised you guys that I would. I told you guys from the very beginning that I wanted to get you some hard data on this Hellcat oil pump installation, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Now, granted, this engine right here is not equipped with the VVT system, which means there is one small oil passageway on the newer blocks that these blocks don't have that could change the oil PSI numbers. 
very, very slightly. But to be honest, I still feel like this is going to be a great real world test to show you guys, no matter what year Hemi you have, what the results would be if you put a Hellcat oil pump on there. Okay, we have done all this. Let's continue with our reinstallation. I'll see you guys when it's all back together again. And now finally we come to the culmination of this video, the Hellcat oil pump test results. It's amazing how long this has been in process and it was quite the project to actually get that thing installed in this engine. But now here we are, same thing as the last pump. I went ahead and ran this thing through a full heat cycle so the engine is ready to go. I didn't cheat and look at the numbers. These are going to be fresh for me as they are for you. The ambient temperature right now, it's a little colder today, it's 33 degrees right now but the engine coolant temp is sitting at 46 degrees. So let's go ahead and fire this engine up and see where we stand with its oil pressure. All right, straight out the gate, we're reading 89 PSI of oil pressure at idle, and that's at 1,000 RPM. We're at basically 90 PSI of oil pressure here. Let's go ahead and rev this thing up to 3,500 RPM. And it looks like this pump is also regulated at 100 PSI. Either that or the oil pressure sensor only reads up to 100 PSI, but I'm inclined to believe the former there. I think it's regulated at 100 PSI. So that's pretty darn good for idle settings. Let's go ahead and get this thing completely warmed up to operating temperature and see what our idle reading is at that time, because that's the important one. So now we've got the engine fully warmed up. The thermostat is open, it's cycling. And right now, as of this temperature, we're right about 208 degrees and we are seeing right at 43 PSI of oil pressure. So obviously that number could drop even a little bit more once it gets really hot, maybe down to like 38 PSI, something like that. But any way you look at it, we're looking at about 20 PSI more than the stock pump. So as expected, the Hellcat is the best performer out of all three pumps. Quite some impressive numbers. I think any way you look at it, those are numbers you could be happy with. And these numbers are very much in line with numbers I've gotten from other people who have done this Hellcat oil pump swap already because I was so slow doing it. They've already done it themselves and sent me these messages that this is pretty much around the oil PSI numbers that they're seeing. Let's go ahead and run this thing up to 3,500 RPM and see what number we get. All right, so it runs up to about 90 PSI there. Obviously more than enough for any situation. So obviously this has been an absolutely massive episode. So much great information in here. I wanna say guys, if you feel like you've gotten some great value out of this episode, go ahead and hit that like button. I really appreciate that. But let's go ahead and talk about some results. So with that stock pump, we saw that when it got really hot, that those oil pressure numbers at idle dropped down into the teens. And that is just not a number I'm comfortable with. Now, if you do have a 2009 or later Hemi engine, you will have a slightly higher volume pump than these older Hemis had. So your numbers may not drop quite that low, but still, I don't think they're going to be absolutely stellar. Now, as you saw on this engine, when we upgraded to that Melling pump, massive improvement and by far if you have a pre-2009 Hemi engine absolutely go with the Melling high volume pump because it is a direct bolt-on fit and it achieves the goal that we're looking for more flow of oil through the engine you don't have to make any modifications whatsoever direct fit nothing wrong with that it works perfectly and it's actually cheaper than the Hellcat pump is now we saw with these results that the Hellcat pump was the best pump of the three as far as volume goes and overall pressure goes, but the number just isn't that much higher than the Melling pump and the amount of modifications I had to do to make this work just does not make that feasible whatsoever at all. However, if you have our 09 or up Hemi engine, 100%, I have to recommend the Hellcat oil pump. It's a direct bolt-on fit to your vehicle. Doesn't matter what model you have. If you have a Hemi engine, 2009 or later, Hellcat pump, direct fit. And now the question everyone's looking for the answer to. If I install this Hellcat pump on this engine, does that mean I will never encounter lifter failure? Look guys, I would be an absolute fool if I promised something like that to you. The only thing I can say to you is, I believe that this helps one of the worst case scenarios with the Hemi engine, and that is lots and lots of idle time. That's when we see the most lifter issues. So therefore, if we can improve our oil pressure at idle by almost double, that can do nothing but help the situation. And I have to imagine that it would improve your chances of not having a lifter failure. Whether or not you'll still have a lifter failure, 
honestly, I cannot control that. What an epic journey this has been for the saga of the Hellcat oil pump. But now that we have finally come to the end of it, that is not the end for our Project Magnum PI. In fact, now we get to move on to the actually fun stuff. I really think you guys are going to be excited about it. Stay tuned and we will see you next time on Reignited.